Well, I'm Dr. Jean-Claude from France. The art which you have in those caves is not the art of everybody. It is art by chosen people, people who have the gift. The fact that people touch the walls, you see, left their imprints on the walls, makes sense because they were trying to access the supernatural power in their own ways. And so caves may well have been places where it was easier to get all the states of consciousness than anywhere else. The drawings we have are of exceptional quality. That means that the people who made them were chosen people. They were elected. They had been chosen by the tribe. Where are you when you are asleep? You are asleep. Where are you when you are asleep? The human brain is organized in such a way that the sense of self dominates our experience. I mean, where are you when you are asleep? There's no self, there's nothing. We just get used to these slices of death, these periods of amnesia. If it happened during the day, you'd be horrified. Eight hours gone. Where are you when you are asleep? So the point is, we develop the sense of self. That's what we live for. When you're asleep. And altered states, and anything that will deliver the altered state, allows us to define ourself more effectively. It's kind of a contrast enhancement. So we can actually define the boundaries of the self. And in many respects, become much, much more egocentric in that process. One of the most important aspects of shamanism, it is what I call fluidity. That is to say, you have fluidity at different levels. You have fluidity between the relation of humans to the supernatural world. That is to say, a human can access the power of the supernatural world. But the supernatural world can access a human also. I'll tell you a story which happened to me about 15 years ago. I was in California. I was taken to a rock outside, and there was a Native American with us who was a medicine man. That's a shaman, right? We talked quite a bit. And eventually, he told me there was a slab, uh, a kind of slanting slab, below some paintings which were hundreds, maybe thousands of years old. And he told me that even nowadays, when a person was ill, they would bring that person there uh, below the, the images and chant and have ceremonies. That was pure shamanism. They were exposing that person to the influence of, 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 the, of the supernatural, of those very powerful images. That was in, enhanced by the chanting. Trying to follow the caribou was very much of using maps, uh, sometimes even using information from scientific reports, and, and visibly interpreting tracks on the ground. But then after about six weeks, uh, I think that sounds, feelings, dreams, visions, things that had sort of been hinting at us all along suddenly hit us very hard and that we, we were able to tune into something that I called thrumming, for instance. And the thrumming was, was a sound that you almost uh, you felt more than you heard. 
And just that, that feeling, that intuition, that instinct almost of, of tuning into a sound that's, that's just on the edge of human hearing, that's so subtle but so strong. And, and I think after six weeks and for the remainder of the trip, for the, for the remainder of the five months, enough of the sort of clutter and the layers of, of conventional society and all the filters that we have to have up to kind of protect ourselves from the inundation of all the stimuli that are coming in, whether it's billboards, sirens, horns, phones going off, you know, the, just the demands that are made on our senses. They weren't being made in such a way, they were only being made subtly and we had opened up and we were so raw that we were able to interpret and follow this wisdom that was in the land. Energy, we believed very much. I have experienced myself. I'm not exaggerating. When I go to in the Buddha Gaya, the place where Buddha Shakyamuni was enlightened, the pagoda or stupa, whatever you say, when you go inside, of course, there is a beautiful image of the Buddha Shakyamuni statue. And uh, in front of the Buddha Shakyamuni statue, there's Little room, okay, little room is uh, quite tiny, okay. Reality, when you go there, it's very small. And uh, such energy is there. You are so calm and peaceful. So such energy is there. But you cannot describe how that energy comes. Who brought that energy? I think that you cannot describe. You can feel it. Not only me, but everybody in that room, they feel it. One of the I'm Dave Whitley, I'm from California, I'm an archaeologist. Something is going on. One thing that seems to be happening, I've spent a lot of time literally just walking the landscape there. Uh, in fact, we've walked our, 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 our potential lines of investigation. Uh, basalt tends to carry uh, a, a lot of magnetite, tends to draw lightning strikes. We know that some quality is causing certain locations to be, in some areas in Southern California, the primary spirit helper of the shaman. We'll have the same, ostensibly seem to have the same kind of theology, means ball but lightning. Lightning, in other words, itself was a spirit uh, helper. We know that shamans made their ritual wands, their ceremonial wands out of as a general uh, rule trees that had been buttes, struck by lightning to draw lightning that would be interpreted as a location with supernatural potency in Native American terms. Well, that that would tend I to stand out going to those locations for a vision quest to obtain supernatural power because they'd seen that power manifest on that location by um, by lightning strikes. We have an account from Native Americans who've cited the fact that electrical transmission lines have been placed uh, into a sacred site, a rock art site, and their statement is that has scared the spirits away. They've left.
There's something about this place. This place. You can feel it. Yeah, that's real. That's real. There's something about this place. It's almost like when you come to these places, you can feel it. Yeah, there's something about this place. You just have to spend a little bit of time. You have to shut out some of the noise pollution to be able to listen to the songs that, you know, radiate out of those places. And that's where the songs come from. Our laws, for instance, are very connected to the land and they're contained in those songs, the stories, and the ceremonies. This is the kind of uh, noise you hear in the system here. You listen to it, realize that it has an ambient quality to it, almost some training. Listen. This is telemetry. 